Okay, Ottawa Cut Glass. It's a little company that you see references to all the time. Peter Kelgren had one little reference in the bottom and that really started me on looking. I do a lot of web surfing. So you surf this, you surf that, you know, things come online all the time. We started saving the data so that we could maybe put something together and find out what was going. So, come on. In the end, we found out from the Canadian, the Dominion of Canada Gazette, that it was incorporated on May the 8th, 1912. It's a long little article giving the incorporation. It lays out all the duties and who is involved. From that, we know that Frank Martin was a manufacturer. Albert French, French was a manufacturer. John French was a manufacturer. There was Robert George Code, a barrister at law. Edmund Foster Barrett, a barrister at law. Frederick Alfred Edwards, who was a law clerk. Una Martha Peck, a stenographer. They were all put down as officers to be involved with the company. You don't get much more than that. Of course, once you've incorporated a company, you've got to have announcements to the industry. The pottery and china salesman out of the U.S. on May 30th had an announcement. New cut glass company is incorporated ah. and it goes on to list basically what was in the pat letters patent when they were incorporated trademarks most companies will be have a trademark Ottawa Cut Glass. It really bothered me at first. I couldn't find anything on Ottawa Cut Glass for a trademark. And then finally, I found something. We found the actual picture of what the trademark would be. And then I found a description of what the trademark would be. It's a representation of a crown similar in design to the official crown as used during the reign of the late Queen Victoria. For some reason, British Columbia at that time was a little different than the rest of the country, and you had to apply to do business within British Columbia. February 26, 1913, we can see that they have applied to do business in British Columbia. The head offices would be in Victoria. It's always puzzled me. Did they actually do business in BC? Never have found out. Would be very interested to find out. I have a friend out in BC that does hunting for me and he's never found anything with this trademark on it. Of course, once you set up business, you have to have employees. Most of the Canadian cutters would be situated in the Toronto area, employed by Gowans Kent, Roden, and Gundy Clapperton. So, of course, we're going to have to advertise for more. The American Flint in October 12 showed some an advertisement looking for smoothers. Smoothers are not the first people to cut glass. They're steps down. I've got more on that later. Again, in January 1913, they're advertising for eight more smoothers. 
sort of makes you wonder a little bit about employment standards. Third ad we found in the American Flint for October 1913. They are still looking for smoothers, but they mention that the company has a new foreman who promises our men fair treatment. Kind of gives you an impression that maybe some supervisors maybe weren't quite the most fair. And we note that it was Frank Martin in the first ad who was the manager at a at the Ottawa Cut Glass Company. Now we find the map of 1913 Ottawa. And this is a map that was uh, put out by the Publicity and Industrial Bureau. I would equate it to the Chamber of Commerce. You can see my three arrows on it. The black arrow is 19 Elgin Street, where they were head offices were first. By 1914, they had changed to Spark Street, which is where the blue is. But way over on the left, you can see that green arrow. That's where the actual physical factory was. It's a little bit of a jaunt. And you can think 1910 thereabouts, what it was there for transportation at the time. You would have to use your feet. Street cars were being put in, lots of train tracks, whether they would go back and forth. It's about four miles in between the two. I can imagine a lot of walking done. Now, once you've got set up, you've got your employees, you've got your cutting firm, you've got your locations, you've started to receive stuff, you open up to the public. And Otto, uh, the Ottawa Citizen on March 20th, 1913, had a nice big cutout to let people know that they were open for business. And this says, 20 years ago, glass cutting was an art. 20 years ago, it had degenerated into a mere matter of demand and supply. It all happened in a few years. At first, cut glass appealed to people of culture and refinement, just as it does today. The glass cutters were artistic craftsmen, proud of their work and jealous of their reputation. Then came the larger demand. The manufacturers tried to fill all orders. Work deteriorated as business grew. In a few years, glass cutting was no longer an art. The craftsmen slowly disappeared. These important facts had much to do with the advent of crown cut glass, which is what the Ottawa Cut Glass Company termed their glass line, and the establishment of the Ottawa Cut Glass Company. Crown cut glass is a revival of the art of a quarter of a century ago. It wasn't easy to begin this revival. 25 years have pretty thoroughly weeded out artistic glass cutters in America. There were no apprentices. It was necessary to seek out the few remaining craftsmen and go back to first principles. But the first effort, but the effort succeeded. Crown cut glass was placed on the market with all the delicacy of execution, carefulness of finish and brilliance of polish that marked the cut glass of three decades ago. Whenever possible, human hands replaced machinery. Individuality was put back into glass. The results? The results are of several kinds. They may spell financial success, but moral failure. They may also mean much business, but poor workmanship. The crown people were looking primarily to the other kinds of results. They are getting them. Today, the crown people merely ask that their glass be placed alongside any in America and compared by an expert if need be. 
The Ottawa Glass Company's factory is located at the corner of Parkdale and Wellington Streets. It is open to free inspection at any hour to anybody. Why not pay it a visit and see how great handicraft was saved from oblivious and in the fierce storm of the modern commercialism? So we know that they were open for business. They were open to the public to come in and have a look. Obviously, they were ready to start selling. Where did they sell? We don't know. To cut an article of glass, there are different steps. The first one is marking a design on glass. Second one, which is usually done by apprentices, is the roughing or the first cutting of the design. Smoothing is smoothing out those cuts and putting in the lighter cuts. They then polish to take away the grayness of the cuts, either by polishing or an acid bath, and then wash, dry, pack the article. Now, this picture is just to give an idea. It's a cutting table set up at a trade show in 1959 to demonstrate cutting to prospective buyers. So we note there that all the ads in the American Flint were for smoothers. They were for the more experienced people. Most businesses would try to protect patterns the industrial design is a pattern it, if you apply for it and get it through. It usually has about a 10 year safety net around it. So Ottawa Cut Glass did apply for and receive three industrial designs. The first one was applied for and approved March 3rd, 1913. It's called Wild Rose and Leaves. According to the documentation with the ID when it or the industrial design when it was put in, it consists of a wild rose flower with what is known to the trade as a hob star cut in the center with a bright finish and surrounded by gray cutting known as silver leaf leaves and stem in the bright finish. This is where the polishing would come in. The leaves would be polished. The hob in the center would be polished in the last steps. And then they would cut the petals of the flower to leave it a gray finish. It was applied for a Frank Martin signed for it and it was witnessed by Frederick Perot. The next design was put in in January 12, 1914. Consists of a buttercup, leaves cut called flat mitre, encircling the flower, called buttercup, composed of four petals emery worked, and each petal filled in with four mitre and one bead cut. Center punted, which is just a smooth um, indented cutting, and square checkered. This was signed for by Frederick Perot, business manager. And I notice I've spelled Perot wrong there. The third design was granted on January 13th and consists of the butterfly. Now, Jenny, I think you have a bowl worked in this pattern. It's the only one I know of. Consists of a butterfly leaves cut called flat mitre, encircling flower called buttercup, composed of four petals, emery worked, and each petal filled in with four mitre and one bead cut. Center punted and square checkered. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that this description of the flower is exactly the same as the description of the buttercup in the last one. Each buttercup flower is alternated by a butterfly designed with wings having eight miter cuts, which are single groove cuts, fairly deep. 
surmounted by six emery work punties. Emery worked is a grayish finish with grooves in it. To each wing and the body, two bead cuts with three mitre cut feelers. Frederick Perot, the business manager, signed for this one. So that takes us up to January 13th, 1914. Everything looks promising. They have their location. They're obviously getting in product to cut. They have employees. What happened? We don't know. November the 4th, 1914. Announced in the Ottawa Citizen and in the Journal of Commerce, Cut Glass Sale. The Ottawa Cut Glass Company Limited have discontinued business and disposed of all their manufactured stock to the firm of M. Biltsky and Son of 20 to 24 Rideau Street. While it is a matter of regret to note the stoppage of this Ottawa industry, yet the fortunate circumstances of the securing of this excellent stock of high-grade cut glass by a city firm of the well-known enterprise of the House of Bilsky is a good thing for the people of Ottawa, who like the rich and beautiful things of life, for it is understood that they intend to institute a cut glass carnival week offering all of this immense stock at astonishingly low prices. Well, that's November 4th. November 6th, we have a nice big ad. Now, I know some people have had problems reading the ad in the article. It can be blown up. There is a lot of information on here and a lot of shapes and whatever, and 60% less than standard sale prices. It can get interesting. Here's November the 7th. We have different articles shown in different names and cut class prices for the sale. November the 9th, again, we have different ones. Each one is getting slimmer and slimmer in items, so they must be doing these ads up as they're going, and November the 11th ad. And there's the last day of the sale. Then January the 11th, 1915, we get the notice to creditors. Anybody who's a creditor, please come to this address at this time, blah, blah, blah. Dated at Ottawa, the 11th day of January, 1915. This leaves a whole bunch of questions. So who were the cutters? We don't know. What does the area look like now? That we can find out thanks to Google Streets. How did they conduct business? Well, again, we don't know. That could take hunting. What type of building did they use for the factory? What patterns did they cut? Where did they obtain their blanks? How did they finish the blanks? From the sounds of the uh, initial setup, it could have been a hand polish, but we're not sure. So, present day Ottawa. The top picture mm -hmm. is the approximate location of 19 Elgin Street. We can see on the map there, I have a white arrow pointing. This is now the War Memorial. The streets in that area were realigned. Originally, Elgin came up from the bottom where you can see the little red and hooked off to the left. Spark Street, which is the first street down, originally went across and took the little hook that would go over the canal. So we have a war memorial built where the original office was. <laughs> Good use. 
I like the way they realigned the streets as well. Made it very confusing trying to figure out where the street names actually were. So top picture on the right, this is the actual location where the cutting shop would have been. Parking lot and a drugstore. The bottom picture on the left is 165 Spark Street, where they had moved their head office to. Now, what was the original building? With some hunting, we found out. The ad is actually for the 25th um, anniversary of the inst introduction of the Bethany Presbyterian Church. In, the, in October of the same year, 1889, it was decided to erect a hall, which would be the personal property of the congregation, Bethany Presbyterian Church. The site was located, plans were adopted, and tenders called for, for the erection of the new hall. The southwest corner of Wellington Street and Parkdale Avenue was chosen as the site, and the wooden structure, now occupied by the Ottawa Cut Glass Company Limited, was built. So its original use was a Sunday school, which means it you know, it was wooden. We got to start thinking back 1910. There could be little problems with a wooden building. So later on, October 13th, 1913, in the Ottawa Citizen, there was a mill fire just around the corner. Consumed all the uh, product that the mill had. But one little paragraph in the article about the mill fire. On the corner of Parkdale and Wellington Street, the Ottawa Cut Glass Company's factory three times caught fire from the dying embers. But all the employees were on watch and extinguished the blazes with chemical engines with which the factory was well equipped. Recently, at the request of this factory chief, um, this factory, Chief Graham had recommended chemical cylinders and the employees had been carefully coached in their use. Now, does it, everybody know what a chemical engine is? It's a glass ball filled with chemical. You throw up, the glass breaks, the chemical is released and takes the oxygen out of the air. Actually, very dangerous, but correct training, that's what they had. And obviously, they knew how to use it. Well, I keep wondering, at, uh, they must have had good arms. My slides are out of order. Oh, well. The people that we know to be associated with, cattle, uh, with Ottawa Cut Glass, Frank Martin, the, this first page are all the people that were cited in the letters patent when they first incorporated. Frank Martin, according to the city directories for Ottawa, in 1912 was contractor, 1913 was the vice president and general manager of the Ottawa Cut Glass Company. 1914 and 1915, he was not mentioned. Well, if we can remember all the way back to the employment ads, they, he was mentioned as a manager in the first ad in 1912. And by 1913, he had been replaced. There was Albert French, 1912, according to the Ottawa City Directory, he was a mill hand. 1913, he was a clerk at M&F Department Store. 1914, he was a foreman at Ottawa Cut Glass. 1915, he was a laborer. John, Fran John French, 1912, was a shipper. Couldn't find him in 1913. 
1914, we have a Mary, widow of John listed. So probably died. I haven't found the obituary yet. Frederick Alfred Edwards. He was a clerk at the records, a clerk of records at the Board of the Railway Commerce from 1912 to 1915. Una Martha Peck was a stenographer for Code and Burt. 1913 on, no mention of her. Of course, Robert George Code and Edmund Foster Barrett, 20, and 1912 on, they had a law ship partnership or a law firm partnership. Those are all the people associated with the initial letters patent. Or lit, From other reading we've done, we know that George P. Brophy, this is again taken from the city directory, in 1912 was the superintendent of engineers of the Ottawa Waterworks. 1913 and 1914, he was the secretary of Ottawa Cut Glass Company. In 1915, my screen is covered up, I couldn't find him. Frederick Pro. Now, remember I mentioned he had signed as a business manager on the industrial designs in 1912 and 1913. 1912 and 1913, he was the accountant for the Moose Jaw Railway. They happened to share rooms at Elgin with Ottawa Cut Glass, and they had the room next door at 165 Spark Street. So obviously he was well, he was probably working for both companies. He was a business manager at Ottawa Cut Glass by 1914 and he witnessed and signed on the industrial designs. Peter B. Mellon, 1912 is listed as a physician 1913 and 1914, he was the president of the Ottawa Cut Glass Company. By 1915, he was a physician again. A.L. Broder, he was a foreman from at least October 1913, but he was not mentioned in the Ottawa City Directory at all. Ah, this is the one I was looking for. L.A. Broder, formerly of Minneapolis, Minnesota, the capable designer of the Ottawa Cut Glass Company, is breaking records as a bowler in Ottawa, Ontario. Now, I'm assuming it's lawn bowling, and I chuckled after I read the article on the fire because I was wondering how good his arm was, and probably he was one of the ones tossing those chemical engines. Now, from the ads, we can get shapes. There were bowls. This is, these are all taken from the ads. We have three different shapes of bowls. The ads listed out three, maybe four different sizes of bowl and shape. We had celeries. They listed cream and sugars, decanters. Cruets, vases, trays, and the punch set. I like that punch set. There were other shapes mentioned in the ads, but they're not shown in pictures. They were water bottles, candlesticks sold by the pair, colognes, compotes, fern dish, hair receivers, jugs, spoon trays, puffs, tumblers. Leads to make a person think they did complete lines in most items. Pattern names. They were full of pattern names. I think I counted 51 different pattern names, six of which we can ID. Three of the IDs would come from the industrial design Three of the IDs were actual named items within the ads. 
someday we will find some information to give us an idea of what all these patterns look like without printed we're not going to find them but that would be tough i would like that now who were belsky and sons they were a pawn and jewelers in ottawa they were located on rideau street the sean pawn shop was opened in 1877 and the second business a jewelry store was opened in 1901 this picture shows the pawn shop. The business name was changed to Bilski Limited in 1915 when Moses Bilski retired. He is actually interesting reading for anybody that wants to get involved in it. He was one of the first to settle in Ottawa and help build the Jewish community. He also had a rather interesting life on his own. Possible end. We never did find out how or why Ottawa Cut Glass came to end until, believe it or not, a little clip in May 22, 1928, Ottawa Citizen where they were listing out the Ottawa claims for war losses and how they were assessed. There is one claim there. Now, they have the claim of the Crown Cut Company. We know that the Ottawa Cut Glass Company cut a line called Crown Cut Glass. This is 14, 18 years later, so maybe we'll give them a little bit of leeway in the names of things. But it was disallowed as it did not come within the jurisdiction of the commissioner. This firm was had to suspend business in 1915 due to shipments which they secured from German firms being stopped. Now... I'm not familiar with any German firms that they would have bought glass out of, but there could have been. However, Val St. Lambert was a Belgian firm. Belgium was invaded in, on August 4th, 1914 and taken over by Germany by October 10th. We know that uh, Val St. Lambert sold blanks for cutting to the Americas. Ottawa Cut Glass announced their closing on November 4th. So it would only be like three weeks later, four weeks later, time for everything to go. Oh, there's so much I could do. I would love to find more information on it. If anybody has more, let me know. That comes to the end of my little present.